Now, why would we say there were four signposts and three journeys? Well, let's take a look at that dramatical structural chart. I'll hold it up right now. Looking at it, we can see there are, uh, this way, there are four different towers in this chart. As I move it slowly, four different towers. Just one of the towers, for example, here in the upper left-hand corner, we'll use as an example, it has a top level, a second level, a third level, and a bottom level. Each level divides what came above it into four parts. And then that, each one of these parts, can be subdivided into four smaller parts, and each one of those into four smaller parts. The top level has the greatest impact on genre in a story. It's the most broad stroke. The second level has the greatest impact on plot. The third level of detail has the greatest impact on theme, and the last level of, of uh, the chart has the greatest impact on character. That's why we see genre, plot, theme, and character in stories, is because the human mind can carry things that far down before you lose track of what you were looking at up here. To be able to conceive of the entire story at one stroke, at one moment, in total, you cannot go any deeper than this and do that. Why? Well, let me digress for a moment about that, and then we'll come back and describe why there are four acts with three journeys between them, four signposts and three journeys. First of all, imagine we're dealing with these dimensions that we have here. We have a three-dimensional object going down to four levels. It's a total of seven different things we have to consider, three dimensions and, and four levels. Well, what do we have with the human mind? The human mind, psychologically, can keep track of seven plus or minus two items in short-term memory. Seven is the average capacity of the human mind to keep track of short-term memory. That's why there are seven numbers in the average phone number. That's why there are seven days in a week for one reason. There are others, but that's one of the reasons that we look at seven as being a very special number because that is the maximum number of the short-term memory in human beings. Why is it such? Because we have two places we're looking. We're looking in the outside world to see what's going on there, and we're looking to the inside world to see what's going on there. Now in the outside world, we look out and we see mass and energy and space and time. Four things. In the inside world, we see knowledge, thought, ability, and desire. Knowledge, thought, ability, and desire. Let me put those down here on the board. I'm going to erase this for a moment. And as I can find my eraser. There we go. And we will put up two sets of four items. One is mass and energy and space and time. And then the other one right over here is going to be knowledge, thought, ability, and desire. Now, why do we have these two quads, as they're called? Well, look at what happens. Mass and energy have a relationship. Energy can be applied to mass like a billiard ball and transferred to another mass like when one billiard ball hits another. Or, in an atomic bomb, energy can be generated by mass falling apart. When mass decays, it turns into energy, so they can be converted into one another or act upon one another. In addition, space and time have the space-time continuum, but you can also arrange things in space that change their arrangement over time and similarly, you can have things in time marked or delineated by how much space they cover. So each of these has a relationship where they can be blended together, or they have a relationship where they can be seen as separate entities acting upon one another. That's looking in the outside world. On the inside world, knowledge is the mass of the mind. It's what's fixed. It's what's solid. Thought is the energy of the mind. Thought is what acts upon energy to move uh, uh, upon knowledge to move it around, so that you can take pieces of what you know and create new patterns, new connections. Similarly, knowledge can bend thought, like you know something is not going to be true, so you don't have to further investigate it or waste thinking time. But just like energy and mass, thought and knowledge can be converted into one another. For example, if you have a single bit of knowledge, it can generate an awful lot of thought just like a bit of mass can generate a lot of energy in a nuclear explosion. But it takes an awful lot of thought to create new knowledge, just like it takes an awful lot of energy to make a new little itty bitty bit of mass. And similarly, space and time, internally, their equivalents are ability and desire. It's the same four dimensions turned outward or inward. Now, why are ability and desire space and time? Well, space 
measures the position of one mass compared to another. Ability measures what we know to what we don't know. So we're able to then draw a comparison by saying this much of what we see is an unknown quantity. We can't make head or tail of it. This percentage of it is something that we have seen before, and therefore we gauge how able we are based on how much of a situation is unknown. Similarly down here in desire and time, time is a comparison as well as a journey. It's a journey as things evolve, but also it's a comparison between what was to what is and what is to what will be. Similarly, desire is an emotional journey, an experience of wanting, longing, or enjoying, but also it is a comparison of how good or bad things were compared to how they are and compared to how they might be in the future. So we have eight things to deal with, and we have seven plus or minus two as the human short-term memory. Because when we're using our minds to full capacity, we can look at up to seven of these things at once, and any seven, but we have to stand on the last one to have a place to put ourselves while we look at the other seven. That's why in short-term memory, in a flash photograph, we can stand on anything, standing on our knowledge, on what we know, we can examine what we see in the outside world completely and look at our ability, th our thoughts, and our desires in relationship to our knowledge. One of them becomes the measuring stick or foundation at any given moment, and the others become what we look at from there. So, regardless of which one we're standing on, we can't see under our own feet. We can only see seven things at a time. And the example I like to use is with a coiled rope. Suppose you take a string and you coil it into twine. Well, now at this point, we have a three-dimensional object, and we also have it going one time through coiling. Let's move this over a bit. One time through coiling. And there we end up with a total of four items we're dealing with, four dimensions. Now, suppose you take this rope, which is coiled through three dimensions, and we are um, uh, just looking at the, the single strand, three dimensions, and one coil. And instead, we take it and we coil the coil. So we have something like this. Okay. Now that one, that still has three dimensions, but now we've got two coils on it, or five. Okay. So imagine in your mind a twine, a piece of string, coiled once, and then coiling the coil. Now it gets quickly beyond my ability to draw. Let's look instead at another one that is a coiled piece of twine that itself is coiled, and then coil that coil. You can pretty much do it. That gives you a total of um, three dimensions and three coils. I wouldn't even attempt to draw it for a total of six that are involved. And now let's go one more step. We picture a piece of twine that's coiled. You coil the coils. You coil the coiled coil and then try to do it one more time. That would end up with three dimensions, four coils, and you'd have a total of seven dimensions. That's as far as the human mind can go. It's a stretch even at that, because you're using up everything, except one point. So if you try to imagine those, you can quickly see that using the external dimensions of three dimensions, and then imagining the extra coiling in your mind, you end up very quickly running out of room to consider anything else. So you only have seven things. Now you'll notice that of those seven things, three are of one kind and four are of another. That's because when we make our quads, we can see one of them all four points, and the other one, whichever it is, internal or external, we stand on one here, let me just color that and stand on it, and we can see these. So we have three of one kind and four of another. Similarly, when we look at stories, we end up with four signposts and three journeys.